Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship here at First Baptist Church. For those of you that are here, for those of you who are at home, welcome. We send a blessing out to you from this place through Zoom and YouTube to our friends at home. It is a beautiful summer morning and we gather together in the spirit. And in our scripture this morning, Jesus gathers the people kind of like this, but up on a mountaintop. And Jesus gathers them to bless them. So John O'Donohue wonders, what is a blessing? A blessing is a circle of light drawn around a person to protect, heal, and strengthen. Life is a constant flow of emergence. The beauty in blessing is its belief that it can affect what unfolds. The word blessing evokes a sense of warmth and protection. It suggests that no life is alone or unreachable. At the gates of time, blessing waits to usher us toward the grace that we need. Isn't that a gift? So come, my friends, and gather in the Spirit of God who comes to bless you and heal you and strengthen you and protect you. But know this, that it doesn't stop here. This blessing goes with you out into the world with every kind word, with every generous intention, and with every just action. So then, beloveds, let's come and worship. Good morning. morning. Please stand if you're able to uh, join me in the call to worship. In the morning, O Lord, you hear our prayers. In grace-filled love, you have gathered us into your house. the three hymns for our hymn sing and who has submitted them. Number one is going to be number 649, Amazing Grace. And that is going to be uh, submitted by uh, Peg Scribner and Sheila McGregor. Um, Peg loves the text and the music. Sometimes she uses it as a personal prayer. So here's the first two verses of 649, Amazing Grace.
And next up is number 20, All Things Bright and Beautiful, submitted by an anonymous person, but still a wonderful song. And here's number 20, first two verses. And here is number 66, Every Time I Feel the Spirit, also from an anonymous suggester. Number 66. And I still have uh, Juanita's rendition of, what was that, the wonderful, merciful Savior? Man, I was all week long that was humming that in the back of my head. So please stand if you are able for the gathering prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer in unison. Holy God, you call us to light. You call us to walk in the light and to bring your love to the ends of the earth. Bless us in our worship that we could serve you faithfully in Jesus' name. You taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Today's scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 5, 1 through 12. I will be reading the New Revised Standard Version. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God add a blessing to the hearing and of the reading of this word. Amen. Uh, this morning, I have the privilege of welcoming Zach Marshall. He is a student at heart. If you remember a few weeks ago, my son Alex played trombone. This is actually Alex's roommate. Um, but he is also a musician, obviously. He is an excellent guitar player. He's got a beautiful voice. Um, he's got extended experience in the world of musical theater. He just helped us with our run of Lion King and Seussical Jr., so he's great on stage as a performer and an excellent leader and role model off stage. So uh, I think you're gonna enjoy this performance of Blackbird by Paul McCartney.
Zach, thank you, and welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us today. That was fabulous. And I, I think, uh, actually, Blackbird really fits with my Mary Olive, Oliver poetry today. So thank you so much. That was fabulous. Oh, my friends, uh, as we come to our time of gratitude and generosity, I want to share with you um, about this article I read recently about how generosity actually changes your brain. Did you know that? Isn't that cool? Come on, there's not a lot of you, so you got to give me something. It's going to be a long morning, my friends. <laughs> so in this study, it was found that those people seeking counseling fared better if writing gratitude letters was a part of their practice. So the, group, the test group was split into three sections. One received counseling alone. One received counseling and wrote about all the negative things that they were worried about and, and that sort of thing that they were struggling with. And one received counseling and wrote about the things that they were grateful for. The last group reported the most improved mental health and for the longest period of time following the study. The researchers found four key insights. Gratitude unshackles us from toxic emotions. Gratitude helps even if you don't share exactly what you're grateful for with others. Gratitude's benefits take time, so keep at it. And gratitude has lasting effects on the brain. And I share all of this with you simply to say that these regular pauses in worship are a small reminder of the ways in which remembering the blessings of God in your life will contribute to your health, your wholeness, and your spiritual vitality. And we know this too, my friends, that gratitude and generosity are intertwined. The place where they lead us to is the heart of God, where we know that we are blessed and loved. And like God, we know with just as much certainty that this blessing and this love must pass through us in order to be made real. Amen. Amen. So let us join our hearts and minds in the spirit of prayer. We give you thanks and praise, our generous God, for every good and perfect gift that comes from you, for the blessing of food and friends, health and happiness, love and life. Create in us an equal generosity, equal to that blessing, that we may live our lives in service to you and to others. For the very sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I invite you to stand if you are able and let's sing the doxology. Friends, as we come to our time of prayer this morning, I share with you these prayer requests on the screen and also remind you to send your prayer requests into the office so that we may lift them up on Sunday and throughout our week in prayer. I also want to take you, have you take a moment to look around you to see who has joined you for worship today. We have some friends that haven't been here in a while, and so welcome back, my friends. It's good to see you. And we welcome Zach, who's here with us today. And uh, to our friends at home on Zoom and YouTube, again, a blessing goes out to you from this place. Before um, I launch into the prayer request, Joy um, is asking me that I would share with you the news that our um, Loaves and Fishes crew is down uh, for this week, uh, in particular on Wednesday. And so if you are able to help out on Wednesday with Loaves and Fishes. It's a really important uh, food ministry that we share in. Um, Duane and Joy and um, Faith can tell you all about what would be required of you, um, but they are in need of help this week. So whether you're at home and watching this and if you could give them a call or if you're here in this place and can help out, I know they would appreciate that. So thank you so much. And so, my friends, we are continuing to pray for Reverend Peter Brown. He has a few more weeks with his jaw wired shut, and so we're keeping him in prayer. We're praying for Iris Clark and for Will, who's going to visit her in Canada. 
So we pray for both of them. We continue to pray for Jim Coffin and Kathy and Terry Fuller. We're praying for Bill Geist and Georgina Gonzalez. For Lewis Hardison, whose surgery is coming up this week on August 4th. So pray for him, reach out to him, um, hold him, and we really pray that this surgery will help him and his quality of life. And we continue to pray for Colin Hazelton and Helen Honey Church. For Edwin Howell and Marsha and Marty Hublitz. For Lindsay Ibera, who is recovering from COVID while pregnant. For Shirley Castelny. For Brent, Brett Linto. Paul got up back on there again. It must have been my cut and paste, but we'll keep praying for him. Tell him we just, we love him. <laughs> We're praying for Lori McGregor as she continues to go through her cancer treatments. We're praying for Steve Marshall and Ann Prezan, for Thelma Singletary and Francis Wilkins, for our friends at Connecticut Baptist Homes, for the residents and staff, and for their chaplain, Catherine Fagerberg, who will be preaching for me here in a couple of weeks, so that would be great to see her. And we pause to pray and remember the fight to end racism and gun violence in our country. We pray for the earth and those impacted by climate change and natural disaster, especially our neighbors in Kentucky who have had unprecedented flooding recently. We pray for our global neighbors, especially in Ukraine. It is my honor and privilege every week to conclude us with spoken prayer. And so I now invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and abundant God, out of the ordinary, you surprise us with blessings so simple and so profound. This day we celebrate perhaps some so easily taken for granted. That is to say, the blessing of the spry, of the spry smile of a sweet child, and the warm embrace of a friend, and the emerging sun at dawn. As we pray then, deepen in us ways of gratitude. Enlarge our hearts and open us to wonder and awareness imagination and alertness to see what is profoundly real, the very trace of blessings so close, so constant we scarcely notice or name them as such. The challenge is that what you offer in simplicity and truth would be enough, enough to know of the love and grace you offer in the living of these days, expressed in the smallest of gestures, and to rest assured that you have called each one of us beloved and then called us to go and to be a blessing. And so may we be so bold, so receptive, and so generous by virtue of your faith in us, that there be nothing left to say except to whisper in the corner of our hearts. Thank you, God, and amen. Now I invite you to stand and sing with me hymn number 19, God of Great and God of Small.
that such a sweet little hymn, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> oh, my friends, here's the end of my sermon series. I hope that you have had fun in the last month being introduced to some poetry as our second text. And this morning, I have two poems for you from one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver. Her first poem here is, It Was Early. Again, reminding me of Blackbird this morning that Zach played. It was early, which has always been my hour, to begin looking at the world, and of course, even in the darkness, to begin listening to it, especially under the pines where the owl lives, and sometimes calls out as I walk by, as he did on this morning. So many gifts. What do they mean? In the marshes where the pink light was just arriving, the mink with his bristle tail was stalking the soft-eared mice. And in the pines, the cones were heavy, each one ordained to open. Sometimes I need only to stand wherever I am to be blessed. Little mink, let me watch you. Little mice, run and run. Dear pine cone, let me hold you as you open. And this second poem, Wild Geese, by Mary Oliver. Friends, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So this is a sermon that I have preached in many forms, and every time it's because there's something in my spirit sensing the need to explore the grace of the Beatitudes that Michael read for us this morning. And I think it's because I'm getting ready to go on vacation. <laughs> so I'm just in need of this calm, blessing, quiet moment with Jesus before I go. So here we are. So here we are exploring the Beatitudes to feel their comfort and hope. And today we read them alongside the words of Mary Oliver who promises you this. You don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees, repenting, for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. It's how I imagine the people felt who were gathered on the mountain with Jesus one day. They were surrounded in despair concerning so many things, and they just needed a moment, a bit of grace to soothe them amidst everything that was going on around the world, in their families, in their neighborhoods. And this is what Jesus does. He isn't teaching here, he isn't chastising, he isn't motivating for action. He's blessing them. We know his words by name. We call them the Beatitudes, literally the blessings. But we often have a hard time with these words. I don't know about you, feeling somehow that they aren't for us exactly when we read them, that we don't quite measure up because of the ways that our brains automatically read the words. Jesus says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in our brains we think, am I poor enough in spirit? 
or I need to work at being more poor in spirit. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And we think, yeah, I think I need to work more on creating peace in the world. Or when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are those when others, are you when others persecute and revile you, we think, well, if that's serving Jesus, then I don't think I need any more grief or persecution. Thank you very much. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that struggles with the phrasing of these blessings. I think we actually have a hard time feeling blessed or believing that God wants nothing more than to bless us. Even when we try not to, we have ingrained in our memory somewhere the idea of a God who is apart from us, judging us, weighing our worthiness, and we're taught we will always fall short. Intellectually, though, we know this isn't true, right? Because we believe in a God of love and grace and all the fullness of that, right? So up here, we get it. But somewhere down deep are voices from our past, whether it's from our families or the kids who picked on us at school or the church that we attended or the things that we read that counter this idea, and so we feel unworthy, poor in spirit, broken, less than. We allow those experiences to shadow our idea of a God whose voice becomes synonymous with the negative voices we hear louder than any other. And we are so intimately familiar with our shortcomings, our faults and limitations, our insecurities and our failures, that when we read the Bible, all of that comes with us, and we feel unworthy of God's grace. This God who knows us and our warts better than we know ourselves. And the thing is, the world reinforces those feelings on just about a daily basis. But today, I invite you to tune out those voices if you can, or at least turn them down, and listen again. Because Jesus isn't setting up the conditions for blessing. He's just blessing. He does not say, if you are poor in spirit, then you will be blessed with the kingdom of heaven. Or if you are merciful, only then will you receive mercy. Or if you are a peacemaker, then you will be called a child of God. Listen, he doesn't phrase it that way at all. It's just we hear it that way. There is no if and then in his sentences, no conditional clauses, even though we mentally insert them in. Jesus isn't setting up the conditions for blessing. He isn't trying to make a deal so that we can know where we stand and can go and earn that blessing. Jesus is actually just simply blessing the people where they are, how they are, how they have come. All the people. Not just some of them, not just the ones that made it to church today. All of them. All the struggling, weak, hurt, vulnerable, lost people. In other words, you and me and every soul on this earth. The smallest self inside you where you feel every bit of who you are not. Where you cringe at what you said or did that wasn't perfect. Where you don't measure up. Jesus is blessing you. Not reminding you of your shortcomings or placing conditions on his love. He is just blessing you. There's one thing I can convince you of today, my friends who are sitting here staring at me like, I'm not sure I'm following her. God's blessing is not conditional. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've been. In this passage, Jesus is just blessing you. So imagine with me then, Jesus taking his disciples, his followers, to a place apart up to a mountain where they could talk and not be disturbed. You'll notice he didn't do that in the midst of the craziness. He took them apart, hence the 
weeks of vacation that's coming up, so that we could not be disturbed. Surely then, you get the sense that this was a conversation about the most important things, to go to such lengths to have it. And there they sit before him, the poor fishermen and the ones who shamed their families by leaving them behind to follow an itinerant preacher, the ones who are trying to understand but don't get it at all. They fight, they complain, they compete with each other, they hold grudges and they don't want to change, and they're more than anything really afraid. And Jesus doesn't take these poor in spirit and set the conditions for blessing them. He just blesses them. He looked out on that people gathered and he saw that they were poor in spirit, that they were beleaguered and grief-stricken at the state of the world, and they were hungering for righteousness and reviled by others for his sake alone, and so he began to speak. And he said to the 15 gathered, Blessed are you. Blessed are you. It didn't make any sense at first, but they listened. They were mesmerized. He spoke in blessing and in promises, and in a way no one had ever spoken to them before. And inside of them, they began to see something that looked like wholeness and felt like peace and seemed to be healing, healing the places they never thought could be healed. Jesus was there, and they knew themselves differently in his presence. It was unlike anything they'd ever seen or heard, and you know what? It was exactly what they needed, just to be blessed. Now, why would he do that? Bless all the people. It's because the truth is that God shows up with blessing in places you never would imagine God would be, with the poor in spirit, with a kid who was called a screw-up and who now is just trying to make his own way in the world, with the teenagers who lost their way in a moment of impulsivity, or with the parents totally wrecked after the mass shooting, thinking they had sent their kids to school that day in safety and are mourning in ways most of us can't even imagine. And God is with you, with your broken, vulnerable self that shudders every time you hear a criticism about what you are not, what you aren't doing right, saying right, being right, and it feels like you're being persecuted and reviled, as Jesus said. Because you know what? If God can be in all of those places, holding grace and blessing for all the people, God can be anywhere. And God can be everywhere. So today I wonder, can you sense God's blessing? Not in the ways we often say, like, I'm blessed with good health, or God blessed us when the flood missed our house. But can you sense the beatitude kind of blessing there deep inside of you where you don't feel particularly lucky or virtuous or noble? And can you hear it when God says, blessed are you in that place? For you are a child of God, and yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. By and large, I don't understand the Beatitudes except like this. So I've been asking myself and wondering, can you listen in on your life and find the ways and times such a Beatitude has come to you and offered you its blessing? So today I invite us to listen to the words of Mary Oliver who said, Sometimes, I need only to stand wherever I am to be blessed. Think about all the places that you have stood last week, 
Some of them were nice, fun. Some of them were frustrating. Some of them might have been times you had tears strolling down your face. Sometimes I need only to stand wherever I am to be blessed. So look beyond what you can see on life's surface and go deep into vulnerable places and listen to Jesus again and maybe you'll find the truth of the Beatitudes made very real for you in a quiet summer morning humming in tune with the birds and friends who come and listen and make you to feel seen in the restorative gift of silence and living simply in the practice of forgiveness and of peacemaking even in the weariness at the end of a day spent serving someone else. Can you hear it? It's a voice coming to claim you and say to you, blessed are you. Wherever you stand, blessed are you. And my hope for you, my friends, is that you would see and know that this is enough. And really, more than enough. Amen. And now I invite us to stand together and to sing hymn number 402, How Lovely Lord. And now, my friends, may you go and walk the earth with eyes that can see the very traces of God left behind in blessings to inspire you. Let the wonder of God enlarge your imagination, the justice of God grow your love, and the mercy of God deepen your humility, and the peace of God rule in your hearts. And until we meet again after Labor Day, be blessed to go and be a blessing. Amen.